In show before we start, so my name is Jean Petrovich, I'm the bibliographical editor at the Echo Center. So the Echo Center for American Studies was founded in 1991, really with the remit at that point to promote the North American collection of the British Library, and then in the last sort of five or six years we've expanded that remit to include the Caribbean and then also Latin America. So one of the things that the, uh, the Echo Center does is we've got an amazing awards program, and so everybody that speaks during our Summer Scholars is an awards winner, either a writer's award winner or one of our visiting fellows. So, um, and so Raphael has put together this amazing program this summer, I can't the words on the stage. <laughs> so, so sometimes the, the kind of pairs of talks are very complimentary, sometimes they're quite random, so I think we've got more of a random kind of pairing today, but it's always very interesting because it's kind of see what all of our fellows are going to be working on. So each of the two speakers today is going to speak for about 30 minutes, sort of one after the other, and then they'll both take questions at the end. So our first speaker is going to be Alex Albinia. So Albinia. Oh, well, we switch it to the So our first speaker is Martin Hessel, who is currently, well, he's a, a writer and a composer. He's written for stage and for radio and for uh, sound installations and also for publication and for uh, recorded music. He's currently doing a practice-based PhD at the University of Newcastle. Martin is a 2021, sorry, 2022 Eccles Fellow. Um, and very interesting CV for us. We sort of last year opened our fellowships up to kind of more creative practitioners, and, and one of our packages involved using the sound up track. So we're very excited as well to be hearing what Martin has been up to. So without further ado, I shall introduce Martin. And the title of the talk is Sonic Migration Gaelic Settlers in the Shifting Soundscape. Uh, thanks, Jean. Um, so this whole thing is going to be kind of a mix of critical texts that I've been reading, my own poems and other people's poetry, and then you'll hear sounds that I've recorded myself mixed with sounds that are found in various kind of archives, library, internet archives. Um, so it's a bit of a collage of my research up to this point in the library and outside of it. Um, so anyway, I hope you can just kind of roll along with it. Really. Between 1815 and 1870, 50,000 people were forcibly evicted, cleared from the villages of the highlands and islands of Scotland and transported to Micmacie or Nova Scotia in Canada. The Industrial Revolution needed meat and wool and the landlords, the dukes and the factors, needed the land for sheep. The crofter families that lived on the land were driven from their houses on the boats. The geologist Archibald Geeky witnessed the forced evictions from Susnish, a village on the Isle of Skye. As I was returning from my ramble, a strange wailing sound reached my ears at intervals on the breeze from the west. On gaining the top of a hill on the south side of the valley, I could see a long and motley procession wending along the road that led from Susnish. It halted at the point in the road opposite Kilbride, and there the lamentation became long and loud. Everyone was in tears, and it seemed as if they could not tear themselves away. When they set off once more, a cry of grief went up to heaven, the long, plaintive wail like a funeral coronach was resumed, and after the last of the emigrants had disappeared behind the hill, the sound seemed to re-echo echo through the whole wide valley of Strath in one prolonged note of desolation. Crofter was in the same room as his voice, a small room with a fireplace. He didn't need to speak, had no one to speak to, but he was speaking anyway. The long note of desolation had faded now, months back, so he spoke, otherwise there would be silence. He spoke the words that were written on the pages of the book he'd found. The words were ordered and spaced to tell him how to say them when to pause, when to stop and start again. There were no other people in the room, in the croft where he lived. There were no other people in the village, on the island, not for a year now. 
In his poem, The Mountains Are Speechless, the great Scottish Gaelic poet Sorley MacLean connects the clearances, the loss of people and the loss of Gaelic. In a sweeping tour across the highlands and islands, MacLean envisions a landscape which becomes silent and unintelligible. The mountains are speechless if what they say cannot be understood, and the many-voiced ocean is silent if no one knows its language. Crofter had not heard his own language since the clearance of his village. The words in the book were written in a different language to him, so he didn't know what it was he was saying. He thought the words made a push to build, which in his own language meant incantation or mouth music. He would be close to the truth there because some of the words in the book described sounds. But the sound of the words was nothing like the sound of the sound they were describing. Still, he spoke each word slowly through, syllable after syllable, sound after sound. And when he spoke the words into the room, it was his voice that he heard echo back from the chimney of the fire. Each day through the winter, he read the book until he got to the last page but one. The page was blank, except for four lines. He read the line slowly and carefully, making sure all the sounds were right and in the right order. This is what they said. I am here at the waters, because in this space between spaces, where nothing speaks, I am what it says. The geographer Doreen Massey suggests that we imagine space as a simultaneity of stories so far, the product of the intricacies and complexities, the intertwinings and the non-interlockings of relations from the unimaginably cosmic to the intimately tiny. A soundscape is this too. A soundscape is always becoming, it's a continuous present, it's always there, always disappearing, ephemeral. And we accompany it in time as one sound joins with another. The composer Pauline Oliveros says that what is heard is interpreted anywhere from milliseconds to many years later or never. Some sounds last days, others split seconds. Some are cyclical, repeating every minute, every day, every year. Some are linear, they start and stop and never happen again. Each sound accompanies the next, joins to it and adds something to it. So all the sounds in a place are linked and acts of violence break these links. They open cracks in the sonic space that the sounds fall into. Violence, a sounding word. Listen, violence. Its result could be silence, but it's not. Because from out these cracks, other sounds emerge. Voice traces, sonic memories, the haunted music of the displaced. The man put down the book and went to the door of his white croft. He could see the ocean, the gulls, the oyster catcher. He could see the sun going down to the water, but without anyone to hear the sounds with, he couldn't hear them. Their swells and their calls had fallen into the cracks and been submerged. But he did hear something. It sounded at first like the wind, but he knew that the wind made no sound itself unless it touched things. And so he listened deeper, though he was frightened. And when the ton sun touched the water, he heard an old man singing like his father did. And then he heard the beat of the women fulling the cloth. And he heard one lone fiddle playing, on, playing an air. He closed the door, sat down, and read the last page of the book. The last page had three lines and then space, and then another three lines. And they described the last sound, which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place, 
for the listener, who listens in the snow and nothing himself, beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. Poets, says the literary scholar Angela Layton, take soundings to draw us into the area of linguistic noise, of poetry's deep sea undertow of oral effects. To take soundings is to undertake a kind of listening that trawls for noise, and then the pun on sounding, meaning to sound out, to search for, and also to dive deep helps describe the way that listening is not an automatic sensory reflection, but a hard-working exploration. To listen is to attend to the changing harmonic depths of place and of language, and its constantly altering sea sounds. Dark shoals of ballast, nautical debris, lilting and inflecting as the current decides, dilating, contracting with the heave of the flow. Pockets filling with broken crab claws and fragments of clamshells with bladderack seaweed and bright blades of kelp, filling up with the sea waves and with the water orphans that drift with the swell. And on the rocks the gannets gather as on the island shore finally the debris is dumped, lost driftwood gathered up in whispers, carved into effigies and buried at the tideline, as the sea shadows still, black as sand ash. Hear the song, that is sung by the four winds, for it is the voice of our awakening, which heralds the rebirth the moon away. So, here we are on Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. The gales of Scotland crossed with their pipes and fiddles, carrying the sounds of their language and the sounds of their memories. The indigenous artist and writer Dylan Robinson writes that it wasn't just the sound world, the acoustic environment of Mi'kma'ki that was altered by the settlers but also it was the ways in which a particular group of settlers, missionaries, residential school staff, music teachers, set about to reform indigenous engagements with listening, 
to the action of settling perception itself. So the settlers weren't just changing the sound world that the Mi'kmaq people could hear and listen to. They were trying to change the ways that indigenous people listen. Robinson goes on to explore Martin Dorchy's thinking on acoustic palimpsests and palimpsest listening. To take the metaphor of the palimpsest at its most material means understanding palimpsest listening to be similarly oriented towards oral traces of history, echoes, whispers and voices that become audible momentarily, ones that may productively haunt our listening as significantly as ghosts that linger. Robinson states that a decolonial practice of critical listening actively seeks out or allows itself to become haunted. This is a poem by Mi'kmaq poem, poet uh, Michel Silliboy. It was written in English, so I can say it. <laughs> and it's called Urges. My ancestral throat wants to howl loudly. You know the kind, a deep language of sound administered from the belly of my inner core. Breath work solidifying, beastly sounds by vibrating pencil marks through an inkling, who suddenly reappears, whispering. Sing a wish-making noise. We are listening, little one. We are always listening. So that piece was made when poet Helen Tukey and I visited Mi'kma'ki, visited Nova Scotia in 2019. We spent two weeks living in the poet Elizabeth Bishop's childhood home in Great Village, recording sounds, writing poems. This is from Bishop's prose piece called In the Village. A scream, the echo of a scream, hangs over that Nova Scotian village. No one hears it. A scream hangs like that, unheard in memory. 
in the past, in the present, and those, and those years in between. It was not even loud to begin with, perhaps. It just came to live there forever. Not loud, just alive forever. Its pitch would be the pitch of my village. Flick the lightning rod on the top of the church steeple with your fingernail and you will hear it. This scream was the scream of Elizabeth Bishop's mother having a psychotic episode in the bedroom of their house. Elizabeth's mother's bedroom was the one I slept in for those two weeks. The church was right across the road. When we were there, Hurricane Dorian hit and I also recorded the crackings of the wood of the church roof in the hurricane wind. The electricity was cut off and there were no candles in the house. So we had to creep through the hurricane in the dark and steal the altar candles from the vestry of the church. My listening practices on that trip were those of a visitor, a stranger. Maybe I heard the trace of a scream in the candlelight in the hurricane. I certainly heard the music, the accents and ancestral histories of the Gaelic settlers. I was aware of the Mi'kmaq voices from prior Eden, but did I hear them with my European ears? I'm not sure. Hmm. On the shore of the lake, we found a canoe made of birch bark. The lake, named by the Acadians as Brador, but its first name, Pitipak, was given by the Mi'kmaq people. And before that, the lake was in an island. In the lake, there was another smaller island that surrounded another smaller lake. And in that lake, there was another island. We'd found a canoe made of birch bark, traveled to the island in an island in an island, and then the mist came. It came with a melody, which was circular, led us round in sleep steps, back to the place we had slept, laid us back down and slept us again. And it left two shimmers, the third and seventh notes, which we swallowed one each in our sleep, and which glimmered our throats, which were gorse, and I woke, and I could speak the same slip talk as the water, say, I'm as real as you are. You carry shells and birch branch, I carry bones and teeth. I looked down at the boy, who was still a boy, and before I forgot him, I hummed his note, the seventh in the melody line. Then I put it where I keep new sounds, behind my throat, on the back curve of my spine. Thank you.